So if you have your Bibles, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 1. This may be an interesting, unique way to start this sermon, but I want to I want to look at Jeremiah because this prophetic word is situated in, in Judah when Judah was being threatened of being taken over by the Babylonians and God was sending them a warning shot, sending them a prophetic warning as to how they could avert this disaster. So here it goes. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 1. Thus says the Lord God, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, And there speak this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Notice what he's condemning them for or or provoking them over. It's justice. Execute justice and righteousness and deliver the plundered Out of the hand of the oppressor, do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. And we know what happened in history was they became a desolation. They did not adhere to the Word of God. They did not heed the Word of God. So I want to speak on the subject of life being sacred. And what I want to do here is use last week when I talked about truth as our, as our guide and our foundation. And let's speak to a cultural issue, but let's speak God's truth to us. I'm not here as a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. I'm here as a preacher of the Gospel. And we're going to look at the gospel and see what it says. Because, you know, I really want our young kids especially, the college-age kids, the high schoolers, the middle schoolers, I really want them to have a biblical worldview. So when they go into the colleges or into the workforce or into the military, wherever they're going, they will have a rational, biblical argument. Not only will they be on fire for Jesus, but they'll have a rational and biblical argument that they can, they can muster up that will allow them to speak truth into the culture and to be able to maintain their faith. Can somebody say amen? amen. So according to the Guttmacher Institute, in, 19, I'm sorry, in 2020, there were an estimated 930,000 abortions. And this is actually down somewhat from previous years. Previous years, such as 2011, 2008, there were over 1 million abortions just in America. In in 2019, approximately 19% of pregnancies in the U.S. ended in abortion. That's almost one-fifth of all pregnancies in America ended in abortion. So in 1970, Jane Roe, which was a fictional name for court purposes, filed a lawsuit against Henry Wade, who was the district attorney of Dallas County, Texas, where she resided challenging a Texas law making abortion illegal except by a doctor's orders to save a woman's life because that's how it was before. And in her lawsuit, Roe alleged that the state laws were unconstitutionally vague and they abridged her right of personal privacy. So the Supreme Court justices in 1973 ruled in her favor and Roe v. Wade became instituted as law in the courts of America. Since then, over 60 million babies have been aborted or murdered. This year, however, the Supreme Court overturned that ruling. And what they did was they really just kicked it back to the states. And they just said, the states, I read part of the, uh, of the legal statement by one of the justices, and, and their argument was, was never in the Constitution for us to make this decision. We're kicking it back to the states so the legislatures and the people of the states can determine if they want abortion in that state or not. And I'm just going to say it straight up right here, right straight, shooting straight. Thank God. Hallelujah, Jesus. It's a lot of prayer and a lot of saints and a lot of work have been done to get America to the point to overturning Roe v. Wade. Can we say amen? amen? So today I want to look at this from a justice standpoint, and maybe you've never thought about this, 
Maybe you've never thought about abortion as being a social justice issue, but that's the way I see it. Because when you look at Israel in the Old Testament, God condemned Israel and allowed them to be taken over by captors for many different reasons. Main one was idolatry, but also there were social justice issues. They weren't treating people correctly when it came to the workplace. People weren't being paid equitably. They weren't treating people correctly when it came to the, the court systems. There was favoritism. They weren't treating foreigners like they were supposed to treat foreigners according to the law of God. And they were killing or harming the most vulnerable and innocent in society. When we talk about revival and revival in a nation, you know, we as evangelicals often talk about, you know, people just doing the big sins, you know. But we don't often talk about social justice and how that needs great reform and the church should be the ones with the prophetic distance standing back from politics declaring this is what the Lord says. 2 Kings chapter 17 is a telling passage. When you study through the fall of Israel and the fall of Judah, 2 Kings chapter 17 gives the reason why God is allowing Judah to fall. And here's the reason. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 13. He lays out all this idolatry that they've been a part of. And he says in verse 13, The Lord testifies against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he had testified against them. They followed idols and became idolaters and went after the nations who were all around them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God that he had made, and they made for themselves a molded image of two calves and made a wooden image and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now they served all of these foreign gods, all these Canaanite gods, but one that sticks out to me here is that they caused their children to pass through the fire. And if you read about this in the Old Testament, they did that to worship a god called Molech. And Molech is a derivation and a twist on the Hebrew word for king, which is, which is Melech. But they worship the god Molech, and, the, and, and I, don't, I don't have a full understanding of what they would do, but somehow they would throw their children into the fire and offer child sacrifice. Now can you imagine how egregious of a sin this was to God? God had given them the Torah. He had given them His name. He had given them grace. He had brought them out of Egypt. He had led them through the wilderness. He had showed His loving kindness and His tender mercies to them. And now they're turning around and taking their own young and casting them into the fire. And I know, uh, I'm just making a logical connection here, but I cannot think about the modern crime of abortion and not relate it to the worship of Molech in the Old Testament. I just can't help but make that logical connection that it's somehow, in its essence, evil. It's at its core evil. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it, it's at its core demonic. And when we have courts that approve of practices like that, I'm telling you, demons are legalists. Satan is a legalist. And when he finds a legal loophole to go through and our nation opens it up in the court systems or in the legislatures, it opens a door huge for those spirits to infect and influence a nation. Just say it. But the Bible teaches us, and here's what I want you to get, the Bible teaches us that life is sacred. The Bible teaches us life is sacred. This is a Judeo-Christian value that has been with us for thousands and thousands of years. Again, I don't care what political background you come from, 
what you've been taught. I'm just going to talk Bible today. The life is sacred. And we'll give you three reasons why. First of all, God created life. He created all life, but I'm talking about human life. God created all humanity. It's a gift from Him. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, according to our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves. Humanity was created in the image of God. The Latin phrase for that is imago dei, and it's huge in ancient and medieval literature. The imago dei. The imago dei means that humanity manifests the presence of God. It manifests the genius of God. It manifests the creativity of God. We can fulfill God's plans and purposes in our lives. We can deliberate. We can plan and dream. We have imagination to create things. We are spiritual beings. We can know God spiritually. We can inherit heaven. We can inherit the kingdom of God when Jesus returns. All of this stuff is given to humans. And so every human being has been created in the image of God. The medieval philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas said the Imago Dei means three things. First of all, it has a natural application, and that is that we can know and love. We can know and love. To know love is a manifestation of God. And then there's a grace aspect of this. We can know and love God. And then there's a glory aspect of this. We can know and love God in heaven. We are created in His image. So the goal, the end game in the Christian life is to grow in the love and grace and knowledge of God so that His image becomes greater and greater release. You know, the ancient theologians had this thing about image and likeness. Their their, their thinking was we were created in the image of God, but through sin we lost the likeness of God. We were created in the image of God, but through sin and the fall, we lost the likeness of God. So what Christ came to do was to restore us to the likeness of God. There's your ancient patristic lesson for the day. Y'all can pay me later. It's not a problem. All life was created by God. And if all life is created by God, then all life is to be valued. All life has value, so we are to value. Life is a gift. It's a gift to be loved. It's a gift to be nurtured. It's a gift to uh, live in proper charity or proper love for humanity. Our love of God should affect our love for other people. We have this horizontal relationship that affects, a vertical rather relationship, that affects our horizontal relationships. So because of that then, any willful destruction of one's life or the lives of others, especially the innocent, is always considered an evil. It's always considered an evil because that life wasn't ours to take. Your own life isn't yours to take. I know that's so starkly different than what you hear in the public arena, but your life has been given to you by God. And so all life is to be valued. Let me just just apply this in a couple different ways. First of all, when it comes to ethnicity and race. We believe as Christians that every person was created in the image of God. I don't care if you're African, if you're Asian, if you're Caribbean, if you're North American, if you're whoever you are, you were created in the image of God. And my responsibility as a Christian believer is to value you just like I value everyone else from wherever they're from. 
And I know it's difficult sometimes because we have different traditions and we have different cultures and we have different languages and we have there are evil people and there's great people and there's people who get on your last nerve. But we are to value everyone the same. We're to value everyone the same because we're all created in the image of God. In the early service, I talked about William Wilberforce who lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s in Britain. And Wilberforce was raised in a Christian home. His father died at nine, and so he was sent to another strong uh, family of strong Christian faith. And they raised him, and he was influenced by men like George Whitfield and John Newton, who was a former slave trader who was born again. He got converted and wrote the song Amazing Grace. If you, if you want to see a movie, see the movie Amazing Grace that talks about the life of William Wilberforce. It's powerful. Anyhow, Wilberforce prayed and meditated and said, God, now that I'm an elected official in the House of Parliament in England, what do you want me to do with my life? And God gave him basically two things. Number one, fight for the abolition of slavery. And number two, fight for the uh, fight for morality in society. And so he was a member of like numerous societies, over 60 societies, I think, for the improvement of morality in society and the abolition of slavery. One day he got up and made a three-hour speech in Parliament talking about the evils of the slave trade. And by the end of his life, the slave trade was eliminated in all of the British kingdom because of a Christian man on fire for Jesus, who had a real experience for God, who stood up and believed that life was sacred no matter whose life it was. Hallelujah. Think about the sick and afflicted. The Bible teaches us to care for the sick. Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And so the Bible teaches us to care for the sick. So there's a man named Charles Rosenberg who wrote a book called The Care of Strangers, The Rise of the American Healthcare System. And when he, what he talked about in his, his, one of his theses in this book was that the American healthcare system, the modern hospital system, developed from a Judeo-Christian compassion for the sick and afflicted. It stems back to the Bible. The Bible teaches us to care for people. The early church fathers cared for people, even to Basil of Caesarea in the 4th century who started a hospital, to the Benedictine monks in the Middle Ages where 37,000 of them in their monasteries cared for the sick and afflicted. If it were not for the church, I don't think we would have the modern health care system as we know it today. Think about the elderly. Francis Schaeffer said back in the 70s, that the Roe versus Wade decision is a slippery slope and that now that we've given into it, other things will come more egregious, such as the killing of the elderly called euthanasia. But Christians don't believe in that. We believe an older person's life is just as valuable as a younger person's life. We believe that a person who might be on a ventilator, comatose, in their last days of life has as much value as anyone. And so it's provoked us to care for the elderly and to stand against any kind of euthanasia. We don't have the authority to take another person's life. The only way I see biblically that we have the authority to take another life is number one, if it's done under a just war cause and you're in the military. Or number two, if you're in the police force and you're called upon, as Paul talked about, to wield the sword. It's given to the power of government to be able to control society in that way. The only other way I see it privately is if you're defending your family or defending your own life. You can stand your ground and defend your life even to the point of death. Can somebody shout amen? amen. So we stand against it as a church, as a Pentecostal Holiness Church. We stand, it's written in our, our covenant of commitment. We stand against abortion. We stand against euthanasia. We stand against racism. We stand for social justice and we stand for the life, the principle of life being sacred and the biblical value of life. Can somebody shout hallelujah? And the unborn, we can make an argument that they are the most vulnerable of all humanity. They're the most vulnerable of all humanity. So if Jeremiah's words are right, you have slain innocent blood and because of it, your house is going to become a house of desolation. 
How much more for a nation that's killed 60 million of the most vulnerable, innocent people that we have? And some say, well, they're not a human being yet. Hogwash. It's ridiculous. It's cra- it's, that's philosophically untenable to say that they're not a human being. Then what are they? Well... Psalm 139, I will give you praise for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Jeremiah, the Lord spoke to him and said, I knew you when you were in your mother's womb and I called you in your mother's womb to be a prophet to the nations. You can't tell me that God was calling a blob into the prophetic ministry. No, he knew it was a human being. But the issue is, and I'm just going to say it, the issue is convenience that we're committing a murder in the name of convenience because we're trying to cover up something that shouldn't have happened. And I'm just going to say it. Listen, don't, you need to just repent. And, and, and once it's out in the open, you have forgiveness and let the healing power of Jesus flow to you. You don't have to go take a life to cover up something. There was someone famous recently on TV who said, well, we should be able to have abortions because think of all these Down syndrome kids. And I don't know if this lady could think that deeply, but if she drilled down into the philosophical uh, basis of what she was saying, she was basically saying the Down syndrome kids aren't worthy to live. They don't have the value of a normal human being. If that isn't evil, I can't show you anything worse than that. I don't know what evil is then. Because I've... You, I, I've encountered Down syndrome kids and they're the sweetest kids on earth. And I know they bless the families that they've been part of. It isn't in our power or our authority to take those lives out just because they aren't like we wish they would be. Life is sacred. Life is sacred. It's God's. Your life is sacred. The person next to you is sacred. The person next to you is created in the very image of God. And love provokes us to fight for the most innocent in society. The Christian value of love provokes us to care for humanity. The Christian value of love commands me to fight for the unborn. 1 Corinthians 13, 2, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but if I have love, I am nothing. 1 John 3, 14, We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Colossians 3, 14, But above all these things put on love which is the bond of perfection. Jesus gave us the the parable of the Good Samaritan or the story of the Good Samaritan. And in that story, it's a man who was hated by Jews. He's the one who picked up a guy who had been beaten and bruised and he showed the heart of God and the heart of kindness and took that guy in and dressed his wounds and paid for his hotel bill. And Jesus said, who was the good neighbor here? Because the command of God is to love God as the only one, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That's, he said, the summation of all the law. It's summed up in those things. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And love provokes you to do that. So finally, if God has given all life and all life is valuable, then we must defend the defenseless. We must defend the most vulnerable. Proverbs 31 verse 8 Open your mouth for the speechless and the cause of all who are oppressed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Psalm 82, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. It's our job to stand back and speak the truth of God and speak as prophets to the nation. 2020, my wife Jackie and I went, it was her last trip, she was suffering with cancer, we went to Gatlinburg, Tennessee in February to preach a pastor's conference for the Appalachian Conference ministers in the Pentecostal Holiness Movement. So we went there and I preached the first night and after that first night went back to the hotel room, got a call from my youngest daughter and uh, she was frantic. 
She was frantic. She was pregnant. But she said, Dad, the baby is only measuring at four percentile in growth. So they've sent me to a special doctor, and we're here, and he told me today, he sat me down and very seriously looked at me and said, you better be making some decisions. In other words, you have to determine quickly. We only have a window of opportunity that you can abort this child. So she called me, and she said, what am I to do? I said, well, we're not doing that. I can't tell you what. I don't know. I don't know what to do. If I could fix it, I would. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you sis, we'll pray for you. So the next morning, I went into the morning session, and I preached on prayer. And I told those ministers at the end, I said, I have a special need. It's for my daughter, unspoken. She just needs prayer. And 300 in that room gathered together and started crying out to the Father. And we spent time praying. Alex called me that, that night or the next morning, and within 24 hours, she had gone back to the doctor, has it documented on her phone, because that's where we document everything now. She has it documented that the baby grew from 4% to 14% in 24 hours. Four, four to, grew 10% in 24 hours. You can't tell me God doesn't still work miracles. Come on, somebody. God still, I mean, hallelujah. So, so it, 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 in a few weeks after that, she went back and, and the great, great OBGYN in our church, Barb Carter, went with her just to support. And they sat there and they looked at the ultrasounds and they looked at all the measurements and Dr. Carter looked at her and said, this baby's perfect. <laughs> and then eventually one of the doctors or nurses there said, why are you here? You just need to go back to your regular doctor. And Alex said on the night the baby was born, he was born perfect. We couldn't be there because of COVID restrictions, so we were on FaceTime. And she said, Dad, I saw the doctor come through who thought I should abort Mav and just kind of looked at me <laughs> and saw this perfect baby there. And I said something in the early service, evidently it's created some firestorm online, but I'm going to say it again. That doctor doesn't have the right to tell you to abort your child. They don't have that right. They have the right to save life. And if there's a decision that needs to be made in a crucial situation, they, can, they, they have the right to go ahead and, and determine to take the baby or whatever, I, whatever extreme situations those are. And I, I'm saying to save life, that's their job. But to come and advise you to abort your child because it might not be normal or might not be this or might not be that, I just don't believe that's in their authority. Amen. Hallelujah. Because I'm telling you something. When you get a report, I, and my family are doctors, so I love the, the medical profession. I'm into it. I'm not against that. But when you get a report, it comes from an authority like that. It speaks something heavy into your life. And it carries weight into your life. So what you have to do is carry a higher report back. And you have to say, I have a higher authority. And this authority says something different to me. This authority says, by his stripes I am healed. This authority says, all life is sacred before God. Hallelujah. This authority says, everything's going to be all right if I trust in Jesus. Though the storms come and the winds blow, he can reach down and pick me up like Peter. He can pull me out of this situation. When you don't know what to do, go to prayer. Go to prayer. Go seek the face of God and ask him what to do. And then lay back in the arms of Jesus and let him do his work. Let him do his great miracles. And somebody shout hallelujah. So listen, man, life is sacred. We stand for it. You kids stand for it. Don't back down. Don't let the other arguments 
confuse you or the stuff that's thrown at you on social media confuse the Word of God in your life. Don't let it take the seed of the Word of God out of your life. You know what's right. It's wrong to take another life. It's wrong to commit suicide. It's wrong. It's an egregious evil because you don't have the authority to take your own life. It goes against the law of self-preservation and charity. Now, I know there are people who lose their minds and and people who are mentally depressed. I don't know. I'm not their judge. I hope they make it to heaven. I've preached their funerals. But I'm just saying, I'm just giving you a warning. You don't have that right. It's not in your power. All life is sacred. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Give me five minutes to preach here. Here's the good news. The good news is God is full of grace and full of mercy. The good news is He can cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. The good news is He comes with an unending amount of mercy to show to your life. So if you've committed an abortion or you've had that done or, or what, you know what? Throw, your, throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and ask God for forgiveness and let mercy roll and then when you make it to heaven you're going to have a child waiting on you at the heaven's gates I'm telling you because all of you who've lost kids to abortion or you've lost kids to uh, miscarriages and stuff like that they didn't just disappear people they're real human beings and they're waiting on you over in heaven's portals so be of good cheer hallelujah God can come and he can heal and he can pour the balm of Gilead into your spirit and heal you from every bit of that the answer isn't death the answer is life the answer isn't shame the answer is forgiveness the answer isn't depression and going out and leaving the church the answer is found in the arms of the community of faith and the answer is found in love and mercy and letting justice roll come on somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you need help we can help you Do we have resources that that we can help you with? Hallelujah. You can can stand for life. And and I'm going to tell you, you're going to thank me when we get over yonder. Let's all stand. God, I give you praise this morning. I give you praise this morning, Lord, for who you are. And Lord, I I don't know what each person's been through in this building right now. But Lord, those who have lost kids to miscarriages, those who have maybe even committed that that act of abortion. Maybe they were pressured. Maybe, I don't know. But Lord, I just pray you forgive right now. As they call in on you, I pray the healing salve of Jesus comes. The healing balm of Jesus comes and heals every hurt in this room. In the name of Jesus. 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 Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, come and heal right now. Holy Spirit, come and minister right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. 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 Thank you for ending this scourge of abortion in our nation, God. Thank you for letting America be righteous again. Thank you for letting us stand for truth, God. In the name of Jesus, righteous nation you bless Lord the righteous nation you bless the nation that forgets God will be turned into hell and so God we stand for truth right now we give you praise hallelujah hallelujah hey I'm Hans Hess thank you so much for watching today and I just pray that this service has been a great blessing to you listen many of you out there have needs you have needs physically you want healing in your body or you have uh, oppression or anxiety you're dealing with or or the weight of an addiction or sin in your life, whatever the issue is, you know, Jesus can handle it. And I want to pray for you today before we leave here and just believe God for the best in your life. You're a winner in Christ. I've read the end of the book and we win in the end. So pray with me this brief prayer. Come on, mean it with all of your heart. Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me of all my sin and wash it away. Heal my body, touch my mind, Lord. Bring total freedom to me today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And if you said that, you can say amen. 
And you know what? Each time a, a sports team wins a victory, they always have a celebration. So why don't go ahead and right where you are and just thank God and give God some praise. Thanks for joining us. Stay in contact with us and uh, come back and visit us.